I was at the Air Force Armament Center at Eglin Air Force Base after having gotten out of the Air Force. And a colleague of mine was coming up in uh, 19, uh, in um, 57. They were going to be hiring people starting ABMA. And he asked me, to, he wanted to take my Form 57 with him, and I said, no, and that I'm happy where I am at the Army Center. I'm not worried. Ah, oh, let me take it. So he did. And about three days later, I got a call from a girl in personnel. And she says, would you be available to come up for an interview? One of the Germans would like to speak with you. And I said, well, I said, I've never been to Huntsville. And I said, I don't want to sound, you know, selfish or something, but we take care of the travel expenses and everything. Oh, anything you need, whatever you require, we'll take care of it. The German that wanted to speak with me was Gerhard Reisig. Okay, Dr. Reisig. About three days later, I, I got a call from the same girl in personnel, and she says, Dr. Reisig would like to know when will you be available to come up uh, and join him. I said, well, it's going to be about a month. I've got things I need to take care of. Uh, I didn't want to burn any bridges behind me, to be honest with you. So she said, he said, that'll be just fine. So that's how I ended up coming up on uh, January the 31st of 1958. And that's the day Explorer 1 went into orbit, by the way. I found out later why he was interested in me joining him. He, Gerhard had been trying to get some stuff done at the Cape, at the range down there. Actually, uh, to fire some small rockets is what he was doing. They were, they were already working on the Saturn, before it became the Saturn, and this was to get some wind shear and wind uh, conditions up at stage separation on the second stage and the third stage at that level. And he was having difficulty communicating. They didn't understand him, and he did not understand them. And he figured because I was coming from an Air Force range, I would know how another Air Force range operated. And Fundamentally, he was correct. I didn't know how a range operated. I'd spent time with it. Uh, the Army was still prevalent at the Cape a good bit. And uh, the, the, the lead engineer for what I was trying to do with those rockets and everything, guess who it was? Rocco Patron. He was a major in the Army at the time. And uh, he and I got to know each other very well. As a matter of fact, I got along fine with him, too, as a matter of fact. That was how I got started, and we collected a good bit of data. The division uh, that uh, Gerhard Reisig had had the responsibility for all of the environmental design requirements that went into, as a matter of fact, the Jupiter, the Redstone, and also into the, uh, what became the Saturn and uh, a lot of other activities. Uh, JSC, well, we formed Marshall in 1960, okay? And when we were working the Saturn and everything, all the, all the environmental design requirements came out of my division. So when we moved over from the Army, you did not have to move. You could stay if you had a position over there. Well, they offered Gerhardt a, a lab director's position if he stayed, so it didn't take Gerhardt long to make up his mind. And about two months after we had moved over, Ernest Geisler was the lab director, and he called me and said, uh, Billy, I'd like to be, the, the Germans tend to pronounce Bill, Bill, that had a ring to it. Anyway, he said, I'd like for you to take the division. And I said, well, Dr. Geisler, we'll give it a try and see how it works out, you know, if it works out. And it worked out well. We got along fine together. Oh, I didn't give it any consideration as being something difficult to do. It was just something that we were going to do. But that was the attitude. The, 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 there wasn't an attitude, and in, 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 in the Germans didn't create that attitude that we couldn't do it. It was just a matter of doing it. And you got to remember that we were already working on the Saturn before we transferred over from the Army. Our time got charged to the Persian rocket system, but that's beside the point. The Persian worked out fine too, by the way, but there was no charge code for 
side, and it wasn't even, I don't know whether they had a name or not, but then, but anyway, moving over, uh, there was a strong feeling of confidence to be quite candid with you. Now, everybody took it serious, but Brian had a real talent for getting people to feel like they were a part of a team and working together. Von Brown created an atmosphere that the Saturn V was our vehicle, it wasn't somebody else's. And people worked on it accordingly. A couple of years or something into the system that we got, those of us that had the vision, got a memorandum from personnel. We were to instruct our people that they needed to go home at the regular hour because there was not funding to cover showers and all that stuff. Well, they weren't. People were staying overtime and working. They weren't getting paid for it. It was because they were going to build their vehicle and make sure it worked, okay? Whatever needed to be done got done. Well, it continued to, <laughs> you, you had to make, had to not make, but you had to encourage people to go home. That's the gospel truth of it. And uh, one of my branch chiefs met me in the grocery store one day and uh, she says, Bill said, I need you to speak with Orville. He was one of my branch chiefs. He, 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 I got a problem. Well, I thought maybe he was out in the car out there or something and he hurt himself or whatnot. And I said, well, Anna, what is it that I can do? I'll be glad to help you if I can. She said, you have to do something. Said, he wakes up at two and three o'clock in the morning and starts working and I can't get him back to bed. Now that's the kind of a work attitude that existed at Marshall Space Flight Center in the, in the 60s on the Saturn vehicle. And that's why we never lost a Saturn vehicle. If they impacted it, I never knew it. Uh, we never got involved, well, I didn't, and I don't know anybody else in the, involved in what was going on downtown Huntsville, for example, or in, in Alabama. You saw it in the paper and all this, okay? But things were a little bit different, too, uh, in, in the personnel area, okay? They were making inroads to work with Alabama A&M to, to bring them, you know, involved. But that wasn't very easy to do because the, uh, they, they, did, they didn't have the, 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 the background, technical background. See, at that time, uh, now they, they got it very rapidly, okay? And uh, as time went by, they didn't have any engineering, as I remember, capability in, in classwork at A&M. They were agriculturally oriented, as a matter of fact, and in that area, and educate, they had an education uh, program over there. A lot of the environmental requirements that were, went into the Saturn, or went to the Rockets General, uh, were not the same type that, well, not based on aircraft, okay? Mainly because the aircraft didn't go vertically, they went horizontally. Now, we picked up some of the turbulence and the dynamics there, but uh, we made some of the very first measurements in the and we had a lot of free agency. I had a lot of free agents, let's put it that way, and dealing with headquarters on getting support too, for that matter. And uh, because we needed the data and it didn't exist. For example, the uh, up to about, I don't know, typically around about 25 kilometers or so is about as high as you had any structure on the atmosphere from the balloon sounding. We needed it higher than that. So we built rockets and we fired them higher than that, okay, up to get stage separation on up, we all shot all the way up to about 100 kilometers. And uh, uh, we got some of the first data that was ever acquired and we published it, as a matter of fact, in, in the literature, all right? We had four, I think it was, Nike Tomahawk rockets. That's two stage rocket, as a matter of fact. And we had had little or no information on uh, the time, time change of the wind structure or anything else up there over a short period of time. So we took all four of those, there's four of them, I believe, may have been five, but anyway, we took them all and fired them at Wallops Island in a 24-hour period. 
I did not have to go ask anybody's permission to do it. But things were different back then, and it wasn't just me, okay? Uh, uh, a lot of the other decisions were, you know, made right there and uh, by the people that were responsible. I mean, Dom made his aerodynamic out of what they did in the wind tunnels and all that kinds of stuff. He didn't have to go get it cleared by somebody. He was responsible for it, and, and, and uh, we didn't have any aerodynamic problems either, for that matter. But there was a lot of apprehension because it was something new, for one thing. Uh, you got to remember, we built the Saturn I, then we built the Saturn 1B, and then the Saturn V. So what we learned on the one, we, we transferred to the 1B, and what we learned on the 1B, we transferred to the 5. So there's a difference back in that era. The Germans were a little bit different in that regard. They worked their way up. They, um, they, they were very strong about uh, testing things and making sure that things were going to work, sometimes to the point that we, they, they broke them in the process to find out. So they, they made sure things worked, let's put it that way. Well, you've got to remember, it was not the first Saturn V. I mean, Apollo 8 went up, and uh, so there was a lot of confidence that it was going to work, okay? Because a lot of testing had been done on it. But still, there was always apprehension, you know? You never know what's going to happen when you launch one of these birds. Nobody was worried that I know of. Uh, we were pretty confident that what we'd done was going to work, and it did. It worked for all of them, as a matter of fact. What made it work was the teamwork that developed and the understanding of who was responsible for what between Marshall and the Cape and Houston, okay? And among the working people, there was a lot of interactions and all this type of stuff, okay? It, it worked as a team, it really did. Uh, uh, for example, Houston did not have a counterpart to my division. Neither did the Cape, for that matter. We worked with them just like they were part of Marshall, okay? And I had complete free agency in that regard. And then there were kind of interesting things that happened too. For example, we did not have the, uh, uh, the lower level liftoff wind conditions that we were going to encounter at the Cape, other above about 50 feet or so. So we put in a, a 500 foot tower down there, 150 meters really, but no, no, five, anyway, uh, I had no problems whatsoever getting it approved to put in. As a matter of fact, once we got it put in, Dr. Devis, he, he had old Lester Keen, the guy that was responsible for making sure the tower got done right, call me and say, ask Bill where he wants the other tower. Well, we didn't need but one, uh, but, that's, uh, but neither here nor there. We had the information we needed for the overturning moment calculations and all that and lift off on the pad and all that. So we really weren't worried about it. Same thing in moving it from the vertical assembly building out to the pad. Hmm? sitting on top of that. Well, we had to do a lot of analysis of the data and everything and run it, for them to run it through their engineering calculations. And we didn't just do it, the inputs, and hand them a piece of paper and, and walk away. We worked with them so they would understand what it was that they were using and how we arrived at it. That was important, I think, to them to know. And, for example, when we when the vertical assembly building was going to be built, the environmental requirements for that came out of my division, the, the wind load requirements, believe it or not. And when I gave the presentation down at the Cape, Dr. Debus and, I don't know, 25 or 30 of his people, we were talking about it, and I was telling him how we had derived it, and I told him it was the 99th percentile for the worst wind month conditions for the Cape that we used. And I never will forget, Dr. Davis says, well, Bill says, that is good, but I want it with 100% confidence that it won't be exceeded. Well, technically speaking, from a statistical point of view, that you, you, that they can't, you can't do that. 
And I, I never will forget, I, lo- I looked at him and I said, how am I going to explain this to where he'll grasp it? And I said, Dr. Demas, I'll tell you, your house will be gone before the vertical assembly building will. I never will forget, he looked at me and he says, Dust is good, we will go ahead now. So there was interesting things like that that made decisions got made uh, of a very sound, a very major technical factor. Uh, nowadays, everybody's got a, 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 an iPad in front of them and a computer running and they run the stuff dozens and dozens of times. Back then, we did not. We had to take what we did over to the comp lab and they ran it and they would call and tell us to come get our outputs. So you thought your way through what you were doing very carefully before you did it. And there was a good team relationship, and Von Brown created that. I don't want to make it sound like he walked on water, okay? He was just like we all are. I've said in many meetings where decisions were being made, okay? And he made most all your technical decisions of any consequence. And uh, if you were presenting from one point of view and you from another point of view, he'd listen to both points of view. And he'd ask you questions and everything, okay? Now, he might decide to go with your point of view, uh, carried, okay? But you were still free agent to go back to the lab and whatnot and try to answer his questions and go through it. And if you thought you had, he would uh, be put in and he would reconvene the meeting and go, and go back over it. And he might change his mind. But there was none of this, uh, well, I don't understand why he did that. Everybody took it and went forward, all righty. The idea was to make sure we did not lose a Saturn vehicle, and we didn't. <laughs> I played docents out at the Space and Rocket Center, uh, and uh, it's interesting to talk to people from all over the world. They have a tremendous admiration, and I'm not joking, because it gets played on us because we're there. Okay. And uh, it's just interesting to talk to the people. They really do have a tremendous, uh, and they'll tell you so, as a matter of fact, admiration, even though personally, the individual they're talking to may or may, or may not, he represents what NASA did. So there's to, and that feeling still exists today as a matter of fact.